Okay, so one of the most important things that we're going to talk about in this section, and which is very uh, somewhat unique, well, not unique to the IAB, but the way that we treat it in the IAB is very specific, and that's dealing with error bars, okay? If you had me in um, grade 10 physics, you remember that we talked about error bars, and what, it, what an error bar is, is just simply a way of visually showing the uncertainty in x and y variables around data points on a graph, okay? Um, and we will have a, an exhaustive discussion on uncertainties um, in general, but um, error bars are really useful and they convey a lot of information about your uh, uncertainties and your errors. So, for example, um, I have a graph of f against uh, 1 over h squared. Don't worry about what these are, okay? Well, f is obviously a frequency. Um, 1 over h squared, that it's going to be 1 over an area, but don't, don't so much worry about the physics behind this, okay? So I have in the x and y directions around each data point, there is a line, uh, and, the, and the length of which under, indicates the uncertainty, and we measure the length according to the scale on the axis, okay? So for example, um, on, in the y variable, which is frequency, it looks like we have a consistent uncertainty, okay? And it, it sure looks to me like if every box is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 hertz, every single box is uh, 2, then it looks to me like the uncertainty around every box would be, uh, every point would be plus or minus 1 box, so it would be plus or minus 2 hertz. You can see that. Now, I've drawn a couple of data points here, uh, often in the IV, like on tests, you'll be asked, you'll be given um, error bars on the first and last data points. I've drawn them here. Um, so see if you can ascertain what the uncertainty is in, these, in the x variable for these first two points, this point right here and this point right here, given by the blue bars. Okay? All right? Okay. Well, I asked you to do it. Um, so uncertainty in F is plus or minus 2 hertz. We talked about that. It turns out that the uncertainty in 1 over H squared for this point is about, and you can measure it if you want, it's about 1 and a half uh, boxes. But you have to be careful because this is the classic thing that the IB does. Uh, what they do is they will give you data on an axis, but there's a scale that is not immediately obvious. So in this case, it's times 10 to the minus 3 per square meter. So every box is one to, uh, is going to be 1, in this case, times 10 to the minus 3 square meters. So this would be 1 and a half. And don't forget that times 10 to the minus 3. That's really, really important. That's for the last data point. Okay. Now, for the first data point, uh, it's a little bit smaller. And if you look at the line, it's about 1 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay. All right. So they can be absolute. If they're, if they're a constant length, so in the y variable, then we call them their absolute, in this case that's plus or minus 2 hertz, or percentage value, which, be, which would be varying length, okay? All right. Either way, an error box is created around every data point, okay? So you see the red box that's created, okay? This red box is really, really important because when we draw our best fit line, it generally, we generally try to want to make our best fit line go through all the error boxes around all the points. Now, I've only shown the first and last error boxes here, but it would be great. Uh, and you can see, you can imagine what these error boxes might look like, even though we don't have the uncertainties in 1 over h squared, the x variable. You can see that generally, uh, this best fit line would go through all of the error boxes at some point, okay? All right, now the line of best fit, as you know, is the line that best represents the trends suggested by the data of a graph. In the IB physics, this line can actually be a curve, so watch out for that. It should go, go, go through all the error boxes. Sometimes it's just not possible. At least it should go more or less through the first and last, okay? Basically, the way it works is um, you have to kind of fit that best fit line um, so that it, go, it doesn't necessarily have to go through the first and last, but if it's well fit and your, and your graph and your data is decent, it probably will naturally. And I'll, I'll give you guys some pointers on how to do that um, as, as uh, time goes on. The exact placement is your call as an experimenter, right? Um, you won't be marked down for your interpretation of your best fit line unless it's just some wild, it's wildly crazy and uh, out to lunch, okay? It may pass through all the points. Often, it doesn't pass through any. 
or may only pass through one or two, depending. Especially if you're using a computer program to do that, you'll see that it often doesn't go through all the points. Um, you determine whether you have erroneous data. Clearly, this data right here is an outlier, okay? And that's up to you to determine. In a lab report, you would actually then have to justify why you threw that point out. You can throw it out if you want to, but you have to justify why you do it. And oftentimes that justification is nothing more than just showing a graph and showing that the data point is, is clearly way off the uh, best fit line. Okay? Don't ever force a linear fit to a curved trend line. Clearly this data here to the lower right okay, is a curve, right? It looks like a quadratic. Don't force a linear fit to it. All right? So you can see how there's a big gray area in terms of how you interpret and how you fit your best fit line to a data set. It's up to you as, a, as an experimenter to really determine that um, after all. Okay? So why do we use a line of best fit? Well, what it does is it gives us a nice visual ballpark relationship between two variables being graphed. And remember, this is the whole point of doing science, right? Is we're trying to figure out how two things are related. If we change one thing, how something else will change. That's the whole point. So that's why this is so, so important, okay? If it's linear, the slope or the gradient uh, often gives an experimental value or a physical constant of significance. So we gain something from the graph that we can actually um, that we can actually convey and it's useful scientifically. We'll talk about this more soon, okay? A couple of things you might have to do. You might have to interpolate or extrapolate, okay? And interpolation means that you estimate values in between data points inside the graph, okay? Um, extrapolation means you have to estimate values outside of the available data. So for example, if these are your four data points and you had you had to estimate the y value at this particular point of x, what you would do is you would obviously just do a vertical line and a horizontal line and then read it off the x-axis or the y-axis. You could also do the same thing uh, for, for data, for uh, a line that's extended beyond the data. Okay? And sometimes you have to interpolate and extrapolate uh, with uh, nonlinear graphs. All right? So it can get a little bit complicated. Okay? So our goal always is to get linear graphs if possible. So I'm going to talk to you about how we, um, how we interpret linear data. And this is extremely important in the IB and somewhat unique to the IB sciences. Okay, So you need to be able to figure out the following. You have to figure out how to, what to graph to get a straight line, even if your original data does not give you a straight line. I will show you how to do that. You need to figure out the slope and the y-intercept, both of which have a physical significance always. You have to figure out the equation of the line, uh, which is, you can be aided with a computer program such as Logipro. And you have to interpret, most importantly, what the slope and intercept mean physically. And unfortunately, Logipro will not do this for you. Okay? All right. So I have a couple of graphs here. Here's a graph of uh, f against x. All right? So you could actually analyze this yourself uh, if I gave you time. It's, you don't really need to do that. But if you analyze this, you'll find that this graph, f of x, is 0.4x plus 1.2. So it's mx plus b. So the slope is about 0.4. And the y-intercept down here is about 1.2. Okay, So that's a linear graph. Um, it's, not it's not proportional, right? Um, the, the two are not proportional, even though it's linear. Okay. All right, here's another linear graph, which is not proportional. This is a graph of x against t, all right? And you can see that it's also of the form, um, also of the form y equals mx plus b, where b is negative 1.6, okay? Here's another linear graph, right, v against t, right? So I expect you to be able to uh, look at a graph, given the scales on the axes, a linear graph, and be able to tell me what the function is, okay? And just a little note here, let's, uh, a little bit of math. The way we write this in um, physics and is the same as in math. f of x means that f is a function where x is the variable. Okay? So f of x contains, this function contains the variable x. x of t is a function in t. t is the thing that varies on the x-axis. v of t implies that t is the variable, and in fact, t is the variable on the x-axis here, okay? All right, none of these are directly proportional. To, read, to be directly proportional, the graph must be a straight line and pass through the origin as we've already learned, okay? 
when you find the slope, if I were to ask you to find the slope of these lines, you always use as much of the graph as possible to get your delta y and delta x. You have to use at least half the data in the IB, and if you don't, you're going to lose marks, okay? So you wouldn't make a little tiny triangle over here with your rise over run. That would be ridiculous. Why not use a big triangle and use as much of your data as possible, okay? So that's really important. Okay, example one. Um, I'm showing, I'm going to show you some graphs, and as I do, I want you to pause the video and maybe write down when you're taking notes on these videos, wherever you're taking that, um, maybe write down what you think is happening physically with these objects and what the objects might be. So it's a series of uh, motion graphs, all right? So go ahead and pause the video and look at graph number one. Okay, so we have a graph of um, velocity against time, okay? You guys have studied some kinematics before. All right, could be a lot of things moving, but this is V against T, and there's a negative constant acceleration. Remember that the slope of a VT graph is acceleration. So whatever's happening here, the object is actually slowing down, but it's not slowing down the whole time. It's slowing down from one to two seconds, and actually beyond two seconds, it's actually speeding up again, but it's in the negative direction, all right? So you might want to really think about that um, think about what this motion graph looks like because in grade 10 we didn't do a lot with kinematics and motion graphs so this could be a pretty interesting topic when we study this in a few weeks okay the other interesting information from this is that the maximum speed uh, is 20 meters per second right whether it's going forwards or backwards that's the maximum speed could be a ball thrown upwards uh, with an initial speed of 20 meters per second if that were the case the slope of this line would be what negative 9.8 meters per second squared Okay, how about this one? This is a graph of vertical position versus time. Okay, all right. Again, it's a negative constant acceleration, and we'll talk about how to interpret distance time graphs um, in terms of um, calculus derivatives and that sort of thing, and looking at the slope of the tangent line and how the tangent line changes. Remember, the slope of a position time graph gives you, gives you velocity, all right, and the velocity is constantly changing and we'll talk more about this, okay? At two seconds, the object achieves the highest point, right? Okay? Don't be fooled into mistaking this for what the graph, what the projectile path would look like as seen from the side. This is a vertical distance versus time, not a y versus x graph, okay? So you gotta be careful about that. Could be the displacement time graph for this graph over here, okay? How about this one? Another velocity time graph, okay? Well, whatever this object is doing, um, it's constantly decreasing its acceleration, right? The, the acceleration, however, is always positive. At around eight seconds, the object achieves a constant velocity of about 20 meters per second squared, or per second, okay? The slope, again, is acceleration. Could be an object dropped from rest and reaching a terminal velocity of 20 meters per second at around eight seconds. It could be, but we're not sure, okay? The last one, this is the sinusoidal graph, very obviously, okay? It's simple harmonic motion, which we'll learn about later. Uh, if you were in my class last year, you should be able to tell me what the wavelength and amplitude of this graph is. Wavelength is about 2 meters, amplitude about 1.5, okay? And the slope is the rate of change of the vertical with respect to the horizontal. We'll talk a lot about this when we study simple harmonic motion. So, um, four VT graphs, or four graphs, not all VT graphs, four motion graphs that really, graphs really tell you a lot of interesting information about the way things are moving. And so um, that's why we put so much emphasis on them in this class. Okay? All right. Okay. So if you think about the following, all right, I'm going to show you guys how to linearize a graph. Okay, consider the following. An equation governing a moving object with a constant acceleration is this. Now, you don't know this yet. I'm just telling you, okay, that this is one of the equations of motion for a moving object with constant acceleration, where V is the speed, U is the initial speed, A is the ex constant acceleration, T is the amount of time that goes by from T equals zero, okay? Clearly, this equation is of the form Y equals MX plus B, okay, where Y is V, M is U, uh, or sorry, M is A, B is U, and X is T. Do you see that? Okay. All right. So I'm going to rewrite it in order to make that more clear, and I've color-coded it. Y is V, M is A, X is T, and B is U. Okay. Now, if we graph V against T, we're obviously going to get a straight line. Okay. 
This is y equals mx plus b. The gradient is 4 meters per second squared. So remember, for a VT graph, the gradient gives you um, acceleration, units of meters per second squared. And can you see that the, the equation is actually V equals 4T plus U, where U is actually 0? This is the equation of this line. In fact, so V is actually a function of T. It's v, we're graphing V of T against T. All right. So pause this slide and really study it if you don't get that. Because seeing the relationship between an equation and the slope-intercept form of a line, that equation, um, it's really important that you see that at this point. Okay? <clears throat> what if the y-intercept had been negative 5? Well, in this case, u would then be uh, negative 5, right? As it is right now, this, the equation of this line is v equals 4t because b is 0. Okay? So these two things are proportional, directly proportional to one another. Okay? Try example 2 before I show you the uh, solution. <clears throat> so the graph is showing experimental data of the acceleration of an object against the force applied to it. So here the force is the independent variable and the acceleration is the dependent variable. I want you to determine the mass m of the object. This is kind of interesting. This question may look familiar to you if you've taken any of my classes before. Let's figure it out, okay? Well, the y variable is the acceleration. The x variable is the force. From Newton, you know that f equals ma, or a equals f over m. Check this out. Turns out that since the relationship is linear, the data is already linearized. Noting that f equals ma and putting it in this form, we can see that a is analogous to y. Well, the y variable is a, of course, right here. Okay, f is analogous to the x variable. This is f right here. And that means that 1 over m would be the slope. Do you see that? This is y, y equals mx plus b, where b is 0. Therefore, the slope of the line is 1 over the mass. <clears throat> and then I can just do a simple calculation to figure out that the slope is, uh, is 1 half, okay, positive 1 half. And so the slope would be two kilograms, okay? Because one over the slope equals two equals what we're looking for, okay? One over the slope is the mass. So very clever way to solve a problem. You might want to go through this um, again just to make sure you understand it. This is what we're going to do all the time in this class from now on for the next two years is this sort of analysis of visual data, okay? Turns out that every function can be linearized. Choosing what to give a straight line is very important. To do this, what you need to do is algebraically rearrange the equation, keeping in mind your constants and your variables. You need to plot any mathematical combinations of your original readings on any one axis. That's still a variable. I'll show you what I mean. And eventually, write your equation in the form y equals mx plus b. Okay? So, for example, <clears throat> This is the quadratic equation, y equals ax squared plus b, where b is non-zero. Clearly, you can see that. Okay? What would I graph in order to linearize this equation? Okay, I'm going to rewrite it as y equals aw plus b. Okay? I'm going to let w be this new function called x squared. Okay? Now, in doing so, what I would graph is I would graph y against w, or y against x squared. So now, I still have the same y variable here, but instead of graphing x, I'm graphing x squared. And check it out. Of course it's going to be linear. It has to be linear. And the y-intercept, it's, it's, uh, it's the same y intercept as it was before. Right? Okay? So pause this. This is super important. I cannot overemphasize how important this is for you to understand what I just, just did here and how I linearized this function. We'll do more examples in a minute. <clears throat> Okay. All right, <clears throat> how about this one? x times y is a constant. Well, if I rearrange that to solve for y, I get y equals c times 1 over x, or y equals c over x, which looks like this, right? How would I linearize this function? Well, I rewrite it as y equals cw, where w is 1 over x. <clears throat> so obviously what I would do is I would graph y against w, which is my new function, which is really y against 1 over x. And guess what? Straight line. Okay? So really make sure that you understand this. Okay? Whoops. Okay? <clears throat> the slope, oh, and the slope here is this variable c. Okay? So that's really important.